Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Before Slavery Museum webinar series. My name is Pat Snipes and I'm the founder of the Before Slavery Museum. I am so excited to share um, with you today our uh, special guest. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the museum. Before Slavery is a new Black History Museum coming to the Metro Atlanta area this October, 2022. The focus of the museum is to bring um, highlight um, understanding to everyone about the ancient past of the people who were brought to these shores on slave ships. It's an interactive and exciting way to view the cultures that African-Americans came from. We um, have found that the continent of Africa was, has a deeper past than we are commonly taught. That's why we're so excited to welcome today's guest, Remy Ilona. Remy Ilona is a lawyer. He's an Ibu scholar. He has written 10 deeply researched books. I have several of them myself. Um, Remy is uh, from Abuja, Nigeria. I hope I said that correctly. He presents and analyzes ancient biblical practices and concepts that have always been a part of the Ibu culture in Nigeria. It's not something new that they have just learned. Please help me to welcome Remy Ilona. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. So um, Remy, I told the, the audience a little bit about you, but please tell us more. Thank you for having me, Pat. And uh, thank you to the audience too. I promise that we are going to have an interesting time. I am Remy Ilona. Or as Pat said, Ilona. Sorry. It's okay, I love that too. So. I am from the Igbo people who are lineal descendants of the Hebrews. Hebrew is the English way of saying Igbo or Igbo. I came from the country that the British created that is called Nigeria today. In that country, I trained to be a lawyer after my legal training, I practiced law in Nigeria for so many years and also taught it at higher institutions at the university and at the polytechnic. While doing this, I was also researching into the history and culture of my people, which by the way, its major oral tradition is that the Igbo people are descendants of the biblical Israelites. I began to research into that and uh, I began to write many books, some of which I have here and some of which Pat has. Oh, yeah. So, one of the books became very successful The Ibos and Israel, an intercultural study of the largest Jewish or Israelite diaspora. Some colleagues in the United States read it. And when I indicated interest in coming over to learn more in order to produce more, and also to take a look at the dispersed of the Igbo, whom I will get to in the course of this conversation. So they helped me to come over. And then um, the journey has been a tough one, but it has also been a very productive one. As I researched, I began to notice that the tools for rebuilding of my society, which as a lot of African Americans and Caribbeans will discover from this conversation we are going to have now, is also their parent community. This community has undergone a lot, suffered several genocides, suffered the horrible trauma 
of the transatlantic slave trade, which it was the number one victim of. I will talk a little bit about this. Many communities in Africa suffered, but history is very clear that the Igbo suffered as a people more than any other people. And Igbo suffered more than other people because Igbos were actually practicing what Isaiah said that the Israelites or said that humanity should do, beat the swords or beat the spears into clothes and learn not to fight again. For you to become warlike, you have to produce kingdoms and produce empires. Igbos produced none. And meanwhile, everybody, nobody in the world would say that the Igbos are not one of the bravest peoples in the world. But because they had this message very clearly that war was no good, they we are not, they did not develop an offensive culture and offensive entities. And because of that, they became the number one primary victims of the slave trade. And then um, more offensive groups like the ones that came from Europe aligned with some that also operated in Africa. And uh, you can now look at the roots of many African Americans and Caribbeans, the best of the community, the strongest, a lot of them were kidnapped and brought over to the new world. So from my research, I discovered that the roots that this destruction, these devastations cannot really be taken care of unless that culture that was devastated in places like the uh, New World are brought back. You know, the, it's very, very essential that I talk about something before I move on. The name of the museum so, uh, was very indicative of something the name of the museum before slavery. What was the society before slavery? The Igbo world was hundreds of Hebrew republics. At the last uh, talk I had, I told my fellow conference participants that the first Israelite entity to exist as a state outside the land of Israel as a sovereign state outside the land of Israel was the Igbo republics. But because of the way history is constructed, this has disappeared from history. So the first slavery museum, I think it's very, very important that you note this down. A huge number of African Americans, Caribbeans, came from, Repub uh, came from Hebrew republics before they ended up as what they are today, African Americans and Caribbeans. So, to get back to what I was saying, I continued to research and I continued to organize Igbos that thought like me, and we continued to look at how to rebuild the communities that have been, that have undergone all this suffering, all this devastation for centuries. And then, um, we are seeing results at last, at least on the research. We didn't have doubts our, our, ourselves, but uh, outsiders who have powerful voices that our people listen to have something to say. And then um, we are happy to announce that some of them have recognized the facts and have been saying it directly that the Igbos are linear descendants of the Israelites, the oldest Israelite community in the world and the largest. And um, I think I'll pause here. Thank you so much, uh, Remy. I, that's a wonderful introduction and, and it covered a lot of things. Um, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask and then uh, later on, we will open up for the audience to ask questions. I will also look on Facebook to see if any of those um, guests um, have questions. You, if you are on Facebook, you can type your questions into uh, as comments and I will pass them on to Remy. But please tell us how 
the Ibu culture, Ibu culture corresponds to the scriptures? Good question. Um, I hope we will not spend all our time on this question because it's loaded. To fully understand what the biblical, biblical Israelites we are doing with humility and with a great sense of responsibility, I say the following. Everybody that wants to understand what the biblical Israelites we are doing very fully have to study the Igbo culture, which is called the Omena, because it is the greatest repository of the culture in the Bible. It doesn't even have a peer. No other culture comes close to it in having, in describing what the Israelites we are doing. In fact, if the Israelite religion has a name, it is the name of the Igbo religion. The Igbo religion is called Omenana. If you translate Omenana to English, what you have is things, culture, traditions, customs you will do in the land in up to 20 passages of the Bible, and very, very clearly in Deuteronomy 6.1, you would find God himself telling the Israelites, these are things you will do in the land. Mm -hmm. And this is what you get if you translate to Igbo. Wow. So, okay. what am I saying? Mm -hmm. Everything the, Israel, the uh, Israelites of the Bible did, which are written cryptically, in the Bible, the Bible does not go into very deep details. What tells you that this is what they were doing and this is not what is what they were not doing is what you find in the Igbo culture. Because I believe that what we find in the scriptures is a reduction, a summary of what you find the Igbos doing. Mm. I can illustrate with a few examples. A certain passage in the Bible says, that a hanged person is an abomination, a curse. It is not very easy to understand what the writers of the Bible we are saying here, unless you fully understand the Igbo culture. Among the Igbo people, a person that took his life by hanging is considered abomination. The body will not be buried. This is Igbo tradition, and this you find in the Bible. And uh, well, of course, this has parallels in the traditions of some communities of the Jews, like the Ethiopian Jewish community, the Ashkenazi, the Sephardi, they have these too. But you can see that the Bible did not go into details. There are so many other examples. If you want to understand the marriage that Isaac passed through with Rebecca, you have to look at the marriage of the Igbos. And where you find it most succinctly put together is in the book of Ruth. We are even the word for marriage. In fact, the day, the day, one day in Michigan, when the, when the, bot, when the nickels dropped, I, I burst into tears. The Israelites and the neighboring peoples, who we are, by the way, they are kings. The Israelites, we are very close kings of the Moabites. The Moabites descended from Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. So, and Ruth was a Moabite. The very phrase that Ruth used to describe marriage is the Phrase the Igbos have for the term marriage, Emma Ogodo, to cover with the garments. When Ruth went, when Ruth was trying to get Boaz to marry her, what he what she said was, "Cover me with your garments." If you travel to Nigeria today, move to most Igbo communities and say you are there for a ceremony of covering with the garment, everybody will know you came for a marriage. So, when the cultures parallel up to this extent, what are we talking about? There are 
traditions in the Bible that only the Igbos can understand. I will give an, one example now. In the very early parts of Genesis, we were told that somebody died in the presence of the Father. Somebody died in the face of the Father. This is so cryptic. This is very cryptic. If you are not very, very familiar with Igbo culture, you wouldn't understand that the Bible is talking about a very profound tradition. The ancestors of the, of the, of the Israelites in this case considered it something that was very, very bad if somebody died while the father was still alive. And the phrase the Bible used is the phrase the Igbos used to describe it. If the Igbos say, I will translate, I'm not interpreting. If the Igbos say, the translation, not the interpretation is, he died in the face of the father. And that's the term the Bible used. Wow. And by the way, we are not only talking of the rituals now, we are talking of the language itself. Adam means human being. It doesn't exactly mean red earth. It means human being. And it's an inversion of the Hebrew word for human being. It is model. Wow. It's an inversion of the Hebrew word for human being. But because of the place of Africa, when these histories are constructed, Igbos that should be mentioned first are uh, always left out. Mm. Even though they carry the, the culture of the Israelites, they live it, they promote it, and they have died for it. Wow. Wow, that was powerful. That is powerful. Um, I have another question that I... Um, would like to ask you, and that is, um, hmm, um, how how do the evil people trace their lineage back? How do you know how how is it passed down? Um, your connection with the people of the book. Every family, it doesn't even need to be written down because if you want to trace who I am today, go with this name Remy Ilona to Igbo land, just with the, with the, with, the, with one word Ozobo. Ozobo. If you get to Igbo land and say I'm looking for Ozobo, and people say, oh we know Ozobo, then you say I'm looking. You get there, you say I'm looking for Remy Ilona. They will point you to my ancestral. My, 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 where my ancestors kept my, the, my ancestral homestead, where we have been for 700 years. And then move back gradually up to 700 years, go beyond that, you find yourself in the migration routes of the, all the way to Israel. Most often times, the professions, what you do, betrays who you are. Mm. The Levites are among the Igbos. The Levites among the Igbos, my mother, came, my mother came from a Levitical uh, family. They do exactly what the Levites we are, we are, we are, we are, we are set apart to do. The, we, the Igbos don't need to do a DNA test to know that they are Kohanim. They don't need to do a DNA test to know that they are Levim. They have an unbroken tradition for thousands of years of doing exactly what the Levites did. That is powerful. That is powerful. If an Igbo, I will go back to something I said earlier. If an Igbo hangs himself, other Igbos will not touch the body until they live until an Ingri is someone. That Ingri will perform purification before the body will be thrown away. This is what the Levites are doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what the Levites are doing. Their job, and by the way, in my own family, my own family, the Ilona family. How did we accommodate Levites? Exactly the way God told the Israelites to accommodate Levites. God said, if your brother, a Levite, is traveling around in Israel looking for a place to live, give him enough land to farm. My family accommodated the family of Levites. We have accommodated them for 150 years. They are still on our lands. Mm. 
Beautiful, beautiful. All right. So I would like to know, um, are these are these all pre-Talmudic? Uh, you know, I just want to bring it out so that people understand. These are all before the Talmud. You know, all of these customs are pure customs of the of the early scriptures. Is that right? Absolutely. All pre-Talmudic. In fact, he was even retained the traditions, a lot of the traditions of Abraham that Moses modified. Mm. That Moses modified, for example, while Abraham married his sister, the Ibos would view that as wrong. The Ibos would not intermarry, would not, Ibos would not marry fellow Ibos unless they are separated by, its, by more than seven generations. That is where we now differ from what Abraham did, showing very clearly that we were at Mount Sinai, because mm -hmm. that was where that changed. Before Moses intervened, before God intervened through Moses, the Israelites could marry their close relation or foreigners. It was Moses that God sent to tell us, no, no, the nation has grown. Now you must marry only Israelites, but they must not be close relations. Very good. And that's a good clarity right there. I appreciate that. Okay. So um, one more question and then we'll take a little commercial break and um, welcome our newcomers. But please tell us about similarities between the Hebrew language and the Hebrew language. As I just, uh, as I mentioned in the last bit one comment, mm -hmm. the word Adam, mm -hmm. that people generally say it means red earth, that is Adama. It could have been derived from Adama, but what does it mean? It means human being. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew word for, 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 for human is Mado. So you could see it's one word inverted. Is one word inverted. And there are so many other words of Hebrew and Hebrew provenance that are inverted like that. For example, the word, the name, or the word that became a name, Nathan. Mm -hmm. To the Hebrews, Nata is to receive. To mm -hmm. receive is Nata. In ancient Hebrew, Nathan is also to receive. But in modern Hebrew, it is to give. Wow. In fact, the Hebrew language and Hebrew language have been compared at the University of Nigeria, Ibadan. The conclusion reached is that they are genetically related. They are one language. Mm -hmm. And Hebrew mm -hmm. can learn Hebrew in three months. In fact, I was teaching class. I was teaching class five days ago. One of my students said, that this language I, I use occasionally reminded her of hers. I said, what's your language? She said Arabic. And Arabic is related to Hebrew. Mm. So if you are looking for words, there are hundreds. In fact, from what I'm seeing presently, if an Igbo opens the mouth, mentions 20 words, 2,000 years after, uh, more than 2,000 years after leaving the land of Israel, up to seven of those words may be Hebrew words directly. Maybe, yeah, because when we look at lion, most Hebrew speakers of today will only know about Ari as the Hebrew word for lion. They wouldn't know about Gu, G-U-R, from which the, 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 the name Ben Gu Rion came. Gu Rion, son of lion. What is the Hebrew word for lion? Agu, G-U, A-G-U. Beautiful. The, 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 the evidence, well, thanks be to God, we are using it for what it should be used for. We are using it to rebuild the Hebrew community because we are not bringing out all this to convince anybody outside the Hebrew community. 
Right. Right. That's right. Okay. If you have just joined us, we are celebrating the Ibu lawyer and prolific writer and professor, our guest, Remy Ilona. Uh, and we want to thank our sponsors. Together We Rise, which is a African-American women's business network here in the Atlanta metro area. We also um, want to identify a book that was written last year by young poets of the African diaspora all over the world. These are young ladies from oh, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, England, US, uh, Jamaica, uh, uh, Nigeria. So these young ladies from all over the world have written poetry and we've put it together in a book called Black Butterfly and you can find it on amazon.com. So please support these young ladies. Uh, I would also like to share with you, um, okay, excuse me. I would also like to share with you here our sponsor, Ruby's Africa. Hold on. And I will share the screen with you. And I apologize for the delay. But it's loading slowly. Rudy's Africa. For short African stories and poems. Okay, here we go. Rudy's Africa. For short African stories and poems. Download on App Store or Play Store today. We'll do it once more with feeling. Ruby's Africa For short African stories and poems Download on App Store or Play Store today All right, those are short stories, animated stories for children that will help young people to enjoy a little bit of their culture, a little bit of their history that they don't get in school so it's a lot of fun and it's very educational. All right, so thank you for um, listening. <laughs> We're back with our special guest, Remy Ilona. I'm sorry, Ilona. <laughs> I love Ilona too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so please tell us, um, um, oh, okay. Now, you, this question, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier how it's not necessary to prove by DNA because this is, um, you know, here in the United States, African Americans, if you ask the average African American if they can follow their family tree, not the DNA test they took, but follow their family tree, grandmother great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and, and follow it back. Most of us can only follow it back a few generations to maybe someplace in Mississippi or Georgia or Louisiana or, you know, and, and or the Caribbean. Or, and that's as far as we can, many of us can go. So with that in mind and knowing that that's the perception, um, the, the perspective that we come from, that's the perspective that, you know, that we live with. We, I can only imagine what it feels like, you know, to be Remy, Remy Ilona, you know, from the land 
and having the ability to follow your family back generation after generation after generation after generation. So you don't need a DNA test. You know who you are, you know, and you have a different perspective than most African-Americans. So my question is, you have groups who are um, providing uh, DNA um, examinations uh, of like the Lemba or the uh, Beta Israel um, um, and, and other groups. Do we know what they're comparing the DNA to? How are they? What do we know about that? Um, thank you for uh, bringing up this subject because I will clarify my positions. My position is that DNA analysis should not be the first port of call for tracing a people that existed 2,000 years ago. DNA analysis should only come in when every other thing falls into place. If people still need evidence, like the case of the Igbos, the language is Hebrew. I think this is the proper way to describe it. The Igbo language is Hebrew language. The culture is the Israelite culture. But we still went ahead, we still went the DNA route because from experience, we know that we are a targeted people. We have enemies. We have people, by the way, between 1966 and 1970, a horrible genocide was carried out against the Igbo people. Because we know we have enemies who have discovered or who realized that one way to also destroy us is to confuse very weak Igbos, tell them you are not Israelites, so that they will keep on wasting time in non-Israelite culture. So we had to sew up everything, tie up everything. So we went the DNA route too, to add further information to what culture, language, and everything have sealed up. And this map produced by my heritage is my DNA map. I am a West African, but it shows that my genes match the genes of people in Iraq, in Israel, in Egypt. So what are we saying? This is one. I will repeat, I will reiterate rather, trying to use DNA alone to say that a group is related to a group that existed thousands of years ago is um, it, it's not helpful. It's dishonest. Because for you to rule out that that group came from those people, you have to find the DNA of those people that existed thousands of years ago. Do you get my point? Yeah. yeah. But if they have the culture, if they have the language of those people, what you may now do is find out if their culture, I mean, if their DNA match the DNA of people that are in that area at present. Mm. And that's what, that was what happened in the case of Igbos. And I'm telling African-Americans, I'm not so sure that they lost everything. Mm. I'm not so sure. I'm not 100% con convinced that they can only trace themselves only 200 years ago. While I was writing this, something jumped out at me. What jumped out at me Olaude Equiano could have been African-American because he came to the Americas. He didn't only go to, the Brit to Britain. He remembered he was Israelite. He came from Igbo land. When he saw the Jewish people, he said, these are like my people. So if there was one, one African-American like Crowdy, the culture of Crowdy, some of the culture of William Sanders Crowdy reminds me of Igbo culture. Even if he did not say, I am, I am an amiibo, what if he remembered some of his traditions? But the thing is that there are people who are determined to maintain a certain position. So they inculcate in people's minds, I don't know, you forgot everything. 
No, people forgot things, but people did not forget everything. I encourage African Americans to continue to dig. And DNA is essential in their case because those that came from the Igbos can compare their DNA to present day Igbos. Igbos are still in the world, unlike the Israelites that we no longer see. Unless we want to be factual and face it that those Israelites we read about in the Bible are the Igbos. That the Igbos are their lineal descendants because it is the Igbo culture that is closest to their culture. Wow. So I, you, I would like to see, um, you know, DNA compared to, say, the remains, the very distant remains in the land uh, of Israel. You know, some of those um, very, uh, you know, couple of thousand years old uh, remains. And then to me, that would be very helpful in, in, in my way of thinking. <laughs> Yes. You know? Yes. Um, so how did Igbos come to live in West Africa? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but I believe there was more than one migration, maybe some in the early uh, years, maybe in um, uh, Solomon's time or, um, and then, and then of course some in, after 70 AD, um, maybe some uh, way back in Moses' time. You know, what do we what do we know? As you hinted yourself, many, many, many migrations, many, many. A few are captured in the Bible, a few are captured in regular history, most are not even captured. But one thing was consistent. The Hebrews from one direction kept on looking for their brothers wherever. For example, if we do not put it into history now, it will disappear. I mean, if we don't put into history now that for over 30 years, Igbos have been fighting in the IDF, protecting Israel. But it's not in history. Wow. Igbos have been serving in the Israeli armed forces until Daniel Lee, a Jewish anthropologist, mentioned that Igbos were protecting Israelis in Nigeria. Was it in history? It's not in history. Igbos were protecting Israelis in Nigeria, helping them. So the migrations are countless, but the point is that it depends on who is writing the history. That is why it's important that every community should produce their historians. That's powerful, right? That's the, powerful. The, the Songhai Empire, the Songhai Empire, which was larger than Spain and Portugal, threw out the Jews there. Where did they go? That's not in Europe, because the migrations, the the the, the, the dispersions from Spain and Portugal, the way history constructed it is that they moved to Europe. Okay, how about the ones from Africa? Did they move to Europe too? How about the ones from Songhai? And by the way, Songhai Empire extended into northern Nigeria. Definitely. But you're not going to like find these things in history because it's not convenient. Right. Right. Oh, wow. Thank you. This is so good. <laughs> I hope my accent is uh, helpful, uh, that, you know, that, that people are able to follow my accent. <laughs> I am. Hopefully, hopefully it's, it's, it's well. So um, this is another question. I have found um, uh, documentation sparsely, just a little bit here, a little bit there. But I just want to bring out to our audience, um, you know, were there people who still had scrolls that had been passed down? You know, some, uh, so I know that the customs, the commandments, and the culture it, on all of that is built into the custom um, and the way of life. But did they also, did, you know, were there people who had scrolls that had been passed down? The answer as of today is that I am not familiar, I'm not aware 
that scrolls have been discovered, uh, but uh, some other religious artifacts have been discovered, but even if they have not been discovered, there is an explanation. For three years, for three years, <laughs> the world descended on the Ibos and starved three million Ibos to death. Destroyed every infrastructure. Destroyed every building. So, what was left? It's just like asking if there, are, if there were scrolls in Auschwitz mm -hmm. or Treblinka. Mm -hmm. the, the, the quantity of small arms fire used in Ibo land between 1967 to 1970 was more than the small arms fire used throughout World War II against the Ibos. So what's left there? Wow. And we know that a common thing that is done in war or, um, you know, when people are uh, conquering a people is that they destroy as much of the culture and the heritage and the history and the writings that they can. And it happened time <laughs> after time the throughout. British government, the British government specifically waged war against the Ibo religion. The British government did that specifically waged war against the Igbo religion. Wow. So even, even in Timbuktu, uh, uh, you know, they had scrolls there, but, you know, can they be found now unless they're hidden in somebody, someone's family? You know, um, there's proof of it, but, but how many times have they been destroyed by fire, by, you know, you know, flood by by war, um, and so and so it goes, and so it goes. Okay, Remy. Before we uh, open up to, uh, let's see if we have any questions. So I'm going to look on Facebook and see if there are any questions that are out here. Those of you who are on Zoom, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. This is an awesome opportunity to get some questions answered that you may have always had or a question that just popped up and, you know, came up out of the discussion. Feel free to just type something into the chat for Remy Ilona. Okay, so there's um, one other thing too I wanted, wanted us to bring up while we're talking. Um, as you said earlier, you know, um, as people migrated, and it's an ongoing process, you know, um, as people migrated, they were looking for their brothers, they were looking for their family, they're looking to connect with, you know, um, you know, people that they belong to. Um, and so some people would move along in the migration, they would stop, establish, um, you know, a community. Uh, some would continue to move on and some would splinter off. And so you have groups that ended up in, in different, you know, different places. So is there a, an understanding of, I mean, they're all one big family and that's, that's the thing that people, <laughs> people lose sight of, um, you know, that we're all connected uh, you know, by blood, we're we're family, whether whether we know it or not. Can you speak about the groups that may have splintered off, or or groups some lagged behind and some moved on, and things like that? My response to this question would be from what I. I can defend what I experienced. 
Nigeria is a country of over 250 ethnic groups, 250 different ethnic groups, which secured its independence in 1960. Prior to British imperialism, which constructed and invented this country, a lot of the ethnic groups, particularly in the south of the country, had very little contacts. Very little. Even when they, they are we are, we suppose there must have been wars during the time of the transatlantic slave trade, but there were no real interactions. But after the British turned it into one country, interactions increased and tensions arose. I'm limiting my answer to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. One of the tribes, one of the groups that could, must be called a tribe of Nigeria was the British, because they were there. Wow. Another tribe was Israelis that came into Nigeria. The only group that, he, that they and the most related as brothers were the Israelis. The other Nigerians found common cause against the Igbos. Mm. So if people that are related have to look for one another, the others did not look for the Igbos. Rather, everybody enjoyed the genocide. Mm. <laughs> when the Igbos were being hunted like animals. The wow. British joined the Nigerians. In fact, the British joined them as their family. So we only recount history so that it will not be repeated. But that is the fact. If there are people, members of the family that dropped off, we are located. There are members of the family that dropped off. We are locating them now in Liberia, Sierra Leone, the African American world, the Caribbean, Gabon, Cape Verde, Sao Tome and Principe. We are Biafran war orphans we are taking. And the last ones are the places I'm talking about. And the African American world, of course, we know how they were taken away from us. I keep on repeating this man. He was British and he was American. And how about the name of, how about this guy that um, there was a particular guy? Um, I just forgot the name. Well, he was he came originally from one of the islands, but he ended up in um Blyden. 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 Mm -hmm. Blyden was also, the, the, Blyden was the father of uh, Pan-Africanism. He came up with it before any other person. He was Igbo. He was the person that added his voice to, he told the world, let the Jewish people that were persecuted in Europe be given the land of Israel. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so we have a question from Josie. And Josie says that many... Um, African Americans have found that they are uh, their ancestry goes back to um, uh, okay. It tells us about what countries, but not what tribes. And um, how do we find our tribal connection? So I would like for you to answer that, um, Remy. But before you do, I would like to say that in the Before Slavery Museum, we have our own proprietary database that we worked on for 12 years. And it connects um, information that we've gleaned from books back that were written back in the 1700s, um, some uh, uh, narratives, um, firsthand narratives from people back in that time. Um, and giving us some clues as to um, not only a, a general geographic area that the people were taken from, but um, uh, which, which tribes they are or which people groups they are um, or were, you know, were in those times, a time period that they grabbed groups, large numbers of people, and where those ships went. Did some of them in early 1700s, 
go um, to Louisiana. Some of them maybe in the mid 1700s went to the British colonies, um, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina. So um, with that information, we connected with the slaves voyages database that uh, the Smithsonian put together. Then when you, when you trace th those kinds of information put together, um, you can kind of get an idea. Um, and family history was one of the things that I like to do. Um, so if you can follow your great, great, great grandmother back to, I don't know, uh, 1790 or something, or 1775 or whatever, <clears throat> um, say in Virginia, then you have a pretty good idea that, that uh, those relatives may have been Mandinka or may have been Igbo, depending on, um, you know, where the, the people were coming from at, during that time and where they were taken. Um, but of course the DNA tests now, you can, um, some of them you can get more information, more specific information, but a lot of it is generalized. They'll give you several different um, uh, people groups or they'll tell you, like you said, a country or a region <laughs> of space. But uh, that, that's my two cents. Uh, Remy? So, some people have benefited also from Gedmash's uh, location of distant cousins. Like if you find out that all your cousins are able, definitely you are able. Mm. Like I saw, <laughs> I saw distant cousins. I was shocked when I saw very distant cousins in Latvia and Ukraine. Mm. Wow. Separated maybe 1,000 years ago. Maybe as Spain, Portugal, Songhai fell. While some moved to West Africa, some moved up. Mm -hmm. Good. That's good. That's good information. Okay. We are winding down and running low on time. Um, I do want to make sure that we cover everything. So at the end of this webinar, you, those of you who are, are on Zoom will get an email. It is a survey, six quick questions. Just give us an idea of what you like, what you would like to see, what, where we can improve, um, and make sure that you put your email address in there and your name, your email will go into a drawing and someone will win a free t-shirt, a before slavery t-shirt. And um, I want you to please also note our website. It is beforeslavery.com, beforeslavery.com. And I encourage you to please uh, visit the website and be sure to give. Uh, this museum is coming together out of the pure heart and determination and commitment of many volunteers who have been working hard for years to bring this to you. Uh, I'm looking for a picture of the t-shirt. And, um, and so your monetary gifts will make a big difference and be very helpful. So uh, you can give on the website or you can give by cash app, which is dollar sign, the letter B, the number four, the word slavery, B for slavery. And, um, and we look forward to welcoming you in person uh, thank you for your prayers because your faith um, is a very important part of bringing this to reality and manifestation. And we thank you for that too. Um, 
Let's see. And that's it. We'll look forward to seeing you in person October 16, 2022, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, Remy, thank you so much for coming and sharing this vital information with us. I loved every second of it. <laughs> Please be sure to look for Remy's books. He's got several of them. I've seen them on Amazon.com. Any place else people can look, Remy, for your books? Amazon. All African right. Americans and Caribbeans would find this particularly interesting since it connects Igbos to Israel and connects African Americans to Igbos. Yes, I have that one too. <laughs> very, very good. Very well written. And it's a gift to the world, something that we needed. And we thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.